Today we'll begin in Matthew chapter 6, verse 31, and continue to learn about why we can trust God and not worry. Important stuff we all need to hear. Here's Pastor David. Therefore, do not worry. Second time he said that. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry. Therefore, do not worry. It's the same argument. He's repeating it out. Saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after all these things, the Gentiles seek. Okay. Once again, the same theme. This is what the pagans do. This is what the people who don't know who God is and don't know who they are do. You, on the other hand, are Christ followers made in the image and likeness of God. You know your value. You know who God is. You know his promises. And you know you can trust him. Why would you act like those who don't have any of that? That's what they act like. That's what those who have no hope act like. You ought not to act like them. They're upside down. We're right side up. So he's making that argument again. And then he says this. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Does that sound familiar? It's the first premise repeated back. Okay, the first premise, if you remember, was therefore do not be like them. For your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. So that, which is in the section about prayer up here, is now also repeated in the section, tying them together on the section on worry. If you've prayed for these things, knowing that he knows, then down here you can trust because you have faith that those things will come to pass, that you will get your daily bread. But seek first, first, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, once again, what do you think he's going to say after that? Do not worry. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Okay. Jesus has made, has reasoned through an argument for us and has given us good reasons to believe that we don't need to worry. And he's made it clear. There's actually a lot more to it if you really wanted to start taking the strings out from Genesis to Revelation. But here is is, is a good snapshot of what he's doing with his argument, with his reasoning, okay? There is something called common grace. Common grace is something that, that the believer and the unbeliever both get. The, it, it's the fact that the sun rises on everybody, every human, and the rain falls on every human. It's the kind of thing that feeds the birds and the kind of thing that feeds most people, Okay, common grace, the goodness of God, the good gifts, all good gifts come from God. And even the unbeliever gets many good gifts. But freedom from worry is not promised to the unbeliever. It's promised to the Christ follower. It's promised to the believer. The Christ follower does not have to worry. The unbeliever, on the other hand, is not promised that they don't have to worry. In fact, they ought to worry. The unbeliever ought to worry. Because they do not have faith in Christ. And therefore, there's nothing for them to pin their hope to. Which is why they run around worrying about everything. Now, most of us in this country, in the Western world, aren't worrying as much about whether we can get something to eat. Most of us have something to eat. Most of us have, I see most of you have clothes on. Good, I appreciate that. (laughs) So that's not, for most people, the main worry. But there are lots of things people do worry about. I've seen on social media, talking to people and whatever, if you want to see what people worry about, just look there. Politics. What's this person doing? What's that person doing? I want this person in office or that person out of office. This, uh, da, da, da. As if God wasn't on his throne. As if God wasn't sovereign. You're running around worrying about what's going to happen. I see people worry about their own value. You know, am I good enough? Am I smart enough? Am I whatever? No. Yes. You are made in the image and likeness of God. You are perfectly who you're supposed to be. And if you'll seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, you'll be just fine. You don't need to worry about that. I understand why the unbeliever worries about those things. Because for the unbeliever, all their hope, all their faith, all their trust has to be in things like whoever the president of the United States is or whoever, whether their job is secure enough or whether whatever, that's their only hope. 
Does their bank account have enough money? Are people treating them nice enough? Whatever it is. But for the unbeliever, you don't need any of that. You have Jesus. You can trust him. Tomorrow is tomorrow. We got enough to worry about today. Not worry about. We have enough to do today. I got enough to do today without constantly worrying about tomorrow. And the more that I worry about tomorrow, the less I get done the things that need to get done today. There is uh, some freedom in focusing on just the stuff that you need to do and having some peace about that. The question for us is, are we seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? First. I want you to think about the last week in your life, maybe even just the last 24 hours. Has your number one priority in life, has a, has a filter that everything has gone through have been, I'm seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. My friends call me up, they want to go to a movie. Hey, what movie are we going to? What's this one? Is the first thing I think about when deciding whether I'm going to go see that movie, I'm seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Is this consistent with that? Because that's my number one priority. My entertainment is way down here. Way down here. But sometimes it gets way up here, right? When, you're, when somebody says something to you that you don't like, before your mouth spurts forth, are you thinking first about the kingdom of God and his righteousness? Is that what you're seeking? Or are you seeking vengeance or the right to snap back or whatever? When you're driving to work, doo -doo -doo, you got the listening to one of the sermons on podcasts. I know how you guys are. And you're driving down the road. And somebody comes in, shoop, right in front of you. Are you thinking, I'm seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and that's going to di dictate what I do here, or not? Is that where we are? Because the promise is that if we'll seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all these things will be added to us. Let me get back to my story for a second. Uh, this anxiety thing for me went on for some years. There was some relief off and on at different times. Um, I learned some coping mechanisms. And, uh, you know, Tiffany and I started to grow more in the Lord somewhat, but not where the Lord wanted me. Um, but it, it came back, this thing came back in full force with a vengeance when I was 26 years old. I had just gone to law school. I had moved from here to Virginia. I was in law school. I spent a month there where Tiffany and, and Corey and Ethan were back here. She had a, a wedding of her friends that she was going to, so I spent a month down there. And in that time, my anxiety became so intense that I was just forced to the foot of the cross. I had nothing left in myself. And in that, I found Christ, and I found a truly transformational relationship where I could rely on him because I had nothing else. And it was a powerful thing. And in the years since, since that day, I have from time to time struggled on and off with anxiety, but it's never been debilitating. It's never been paralyzing. It's never kept me from the things that God's had for me. What it has done is, is always reminded me and pushed me to trust God more and more. More and more and more and more. I would say in the past couple of years, the Lord has, has helped me to press more and more and more into him in, in, in a more uh, powerful way. It's just increased powerfully in the last couple of years. Continue. I hope it continues to increase. The more I trust him, the more I believe what he says. And the less I worry. The less I worry. The more clearly I see the world, the more clearly I see the kingdom of God. The more that I trust him. It is an incredible blessing to grow in the Lord. If you have not experienced what it looks like to see your own growth in the Lord, it is an incredible blessing. But here's the thing. If you want to grow in the Lord, you've got to trust him more and more. That's how it works. If you've ever been in a relationship, you know that trust builds over time. When you see somebody do something, and they do it again, and they do it again, and they do it again, and they come through, and they come through, and they come through, your trust tends to go up and up and up. You depend on them more and more and more. Very few of us are completely trustworthy. But the amount of trust we have for people and our relationships we have usually depends on how much they've shown us. 
In the case with God, as you trust him more and more and more, as you know him more and more and more, as you press into him, as you seek first the kingdom of God more and more and more, you come to trust him more and more. And then you come to love him more and more and more. Because he comes through and he comes through and he comes through. And he's already come through with his death and rising again. And so you just continue to push in. Now, I want to take an aside for a second and tell you this. Remember this. I am not saying that you should never feel sad. Jesus is not saying that you should never feel sad. Jesus is not saying that you're not going to experience pain. In fact, quite the opposite. We know persecution will come. We know difficulties will come. We know trials will come. These are part of the fallen world that we live in. This is the nature of why we need Jesus, because the world has fallen, and you will have difficulties, and you will go through pain, and you will have sadness. All of those things are true. And Jesus also tells us in Revelation specifically that those things will be done away with when all things are made new. So that is our hope that we look forward to, that drives us forward. You will be sad sometimes. You will feel pain sometimes. I mean, read the Psalms. There are some pain, pain people. Pained people in the Psalms, crying out, why, God? How long, God? How long, Lord, will I have to deal with this? There's people in pain. Look at the life of Paul the Apostle, okay? This is from Acts 9.16. The Lord's talking to Ananias, who's going to bring Paul in, and Ananias is freaked out because Paul is a Christian murderer, basically, because he's been persecuting Christians, and Ananias is a Christian. He's like, I don't know about this. And Jesus is like, no, no, no I got it. He's, he's going to work for me. And then he says this, For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And if you know much about Paul in his life, you know he did. Suffer for Jesus' name. Big time. So it's going to happen. Suffering is part of living in this world. And it is also something God uses as he uses all things for good. Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. He's going to work it all for good. And the pain and the difficulty in life, he will work that together for good. And part of what he does is in all of that stuff, he draws you closer to him. I can tell you that I would never wish the kind of pain that I had from my anxiety disorder on anyone. It was truly horrific. It was horrible. And yet I wouldn't give it up for a second because I know that, it, that, it, that as a rebellious, wicked sinner, it drove me into the arms of Jesus. And I wouldn't give that up and I wouldn't give the relationship I have with Jesus up for a second just to be more comfortable and to have not suffered in that way. God can use suffering. He used it in Paul, right? Paul had a thorn in the flesh. He's like, Lord, take it away. Three times he asked. God says, no. I'm not taking it away. You're going to suffer with this because my grace is sufficient for you and my strength is made perfect in your weakness. That's who we need to be. It keeps us humble and it keeps us just driving towards the Lord and trusting him. Something that for eternity we will need. Now, I am not saying that worrying is... I'm not saying that because you don't worry, you shouldn't do anything. Some people think, oh, yeah, I'm not worried. I'm not worried about going to work tomorrow. <laughs> That's not what he means. Okay? It's not what he means. It's not talking about not worrying about doing the things that you should do. We're doers. We're believers. We're Christ followers, especially at this church. We're go, do, go, do for the kingdom of God because we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto us. We're go, we're do. Don't, don't tell me, I don't worry about anything. When what you mean is, I don't do anything. <laughs> That's not what he's talking about, okay? There are difficulties. There are tough things. They're not to be worried about and they're not to be feared. We're to trust God. Jesus is in the boat with his disciples. This is in Mark 4. Some of you who are doing your daily Bible reading plan probably have read this recently. It's four, Mark 4, 35 through 41. He's in, he's in the boat. They're cruising cross, and a storm starts. Big squall storm, okay? The winds, the waves, the water's coming to the boat. The disciples are, oh my gosh, we're going to die. We're going to die. And they go, where's Jesus? Which is what we should all ask whenever we're in trouble, right? Where's Jesus? Oh yeah, I can pray to him right now. He can be here for me. But they're like, where's Jesus? They couldn't find him. 
So they go look for Jesus. I mean, literally, they're about to go down. They all think they're going to die. And then where's Jesus? He's, he's up in the, in the thing, on a pill, sleeping, taking a nap. He is napping while they're all going to die, and the ship's going down. And they are freaked out, and he is chilling, taking a nap. Why? Because he's God. Because the Son submitted to the will of the Father and trusted completely, completely, that he was not going to die on the, on the sea right there. He knew what he was, where he was going to die. But even if he was going to die, he wasn't going to worry about it. Fear was not going to define him. Because God does not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. We do not have to be afraid. If you live in Christ and you seek his kingdom first and his righteousness, you will not have to fear. You can be like Jesus, sleeping while all the Gentiles are running around freaking. That's where you can be. You can look to the Lord and say, I trust you and sleep on the boat. That seems like it's going down. Because you trust God. If it goes down, it goes down. I can't control, in, the case, in this case, the wind and the waves. But what's really interesting about that story is Jesus could. He got up and rebuked the wind and the waves, and they stopped. Where's your faith, he says to them. I am in control. I'm God. We're not. So the wind and the waves come, and we go, we don't have any control. We're all going to die. And God goes, chill. If I want you to die, you're going to die. I know when that's going to happen. And if I don't, you won't, but you have no control over it. So why are you freaking out? Why don't you trust me? Where's your faith? For some of you who are not believers, who are not going to put your trust in Jesus Christ, you might think to yourself, is this for me? Is this promise for me? The answer is, it's not. I know that's harsh. This is not a promise to the unbeliever. This is a promise to the believer, to the Christ follower, who will seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. While there's common grace, you, if you are not trusting God, there is nothing else, nothing else that you can put your trust in that will be solid. It's all going to slip away. You can't put it in your bank account. You can't put it in other people. You can't put it in the government. You can't put it on your sports team. You can't put it on any of that stuff. If you don't have Jesus, the promise that you won't worry is not for you. But there's good news. He died for you too. He rose again for you too. And you can know him. This is what Romans 10, 9 says. This is how easy it is. It's not easy to, to walk the walk, but coming on in, being with Jesus is easy. This is it. Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you want freedom, peace, you want Jesus. He loves you. He cares for you a lot more than the lilies of the field and the birds of the air. More than anything. He died for you. And you can live in him. You need to be his follower to trust him. You can't trust him if you don't believe he's Lord. But if you do, you can. And you won't have to worry anymore about being under judgment because you haven't been saved because you can be saved and you can be saved today. And if you're not saved, you ought to get saved today. It doesn't have to be the case for you that you live in worry and fear. Come to Jesus today. Today. Become his disciple, live in him. And if you live in him and you walk with him, eventually you'll be that person sleeping in the boat while the waves are crashing on everybody else because you trust him that much. I can tell you in my life that that has been the case. That I take a lot of naps, I mean. But also, also that I just have that kind of trust for Jesus. And I've had to. He's put me in the position to have to. And I thank him for it. Now, if you're a Christ follower, you need to ask yourself, what are you worried about? What are you worried about? Do you trust Jesus? Do you trust him? If you trust Jesus, then wake up every morning and tell yourself, I trust Jesus. Jesus, I trust you. Thank you that I can trust you. So that you start your day in the right place, trusting God. And then all day long, 
Every time something comes at you, that person cuts you off, that thing, you find out that bill came that you don't have money for this month, whatever it is, is, before the fear and the worry get a chance to creep in, say to yourself, I trust Jesus. Pray to God, Lord, I trust you. Thank you that I can trust you. Thank you that I can trust you. So you're telling yourself and you're telling the Lord that you trust him. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Always there, always there. I'm telling you, you will live a life that becomes progressively less and less and less and less worrisome. You'll be more and more and more content with what you have. You'll stop feeling like you need to seek after the next thing, the next big thing, the next big promotion, the next nice car, the next whatever. That stuff will start to fade away because you just trust God so much and that when you get blessings, you enjoy them more. I mean, this is life-changing, transformational stuff if you can live this way. And so I pray for you that you can. We do not need to be afraid. We do not need to worry. We have Jesus. He has saved us, and he will surely and certainly finish what he started in you and in me. He will make you new. Once again, if worry has become a real problem in your life, Let me encourage you to check out our podcast episodes 38 through 41 on anxiety. They're life-changing. And if you don't know Jesus, but you know you need to, take care of that right now, wherever you are. Just thank Him for dying for your sins. Ask Him to save you and be the Lord of your life, and He will. And then contact us, won't you? We'd love to help you get started living in the peace and hope of living in Christ. Call us at 360-885-9000 or use info at axchurchnw.org. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time for an important episode about judging others. That's right here on Contemplate. Contemplate.